Well, I think there are only two really big questions for science still to answer. Lots of little ones, of course, but one of them is the nature of consciousness and the nature of understanding and how science can illuminate aesthetics. And the other one is the, you know, where it all comes from and how it came about. So how did absolutely nothing roll over into being what appears to be something? And science is moving towards being able to answer that kind of question, maybe years off, but nevertheless, that's its direction of travel. I, I mean, science is, over the past, well, a century really, has been moving back in time, looking at the, um, the current universe in ever more detail and going back really very close to the moment of inception. And it'd be rather disheartening to think that we're going to be stumped and not be able to get back right to the instant of inception. And indeed, even to think beyond that and to say, well, uh, how is it that it came about? And, and I, scientists are optimists and they should always think that really big questions will be resolved if they spend enough time and effort, and I'm afraid money, in, um, in tackling those questions. So I think that you know, science has got back to within, reliably in this universe, to within nanoseconds, uh, plausibly to, uh, to within fractions of nanoseconds. And I'd hate to think that there was a barrier that, that prevented us getting back to year dot. Oh, it's not time travel in, um, in the science fiction sense. It's really looking back in time. And looking back in time um, observationally, because uh, when we look into the, in, into the universe through our telescopes, we're, we're looking back in time, and so it's effectively because of the finite speed of light. So um, observationally, we're looking further and further back to nearly 14 billion years ago when the universe began, but also theoretically that we can construct theories about the evolution of the universe and trace those theories back in time. So does that mean that we have some sort of equipment that is basically like a very, very, very advanced telescope? No, it means we have equipment like very ordinary telescopes. I mean, the, the, of course, the, the more sensitive they are, the, the more distant the object that you can observe sensibly, and the more distant, then the longer the light has taken to reach us, and therefore um, the further back in time it began its journey towards us. So that's simply our time, we can do time travel in that sense, simply by looking at very distant objects, and the, 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 the more sensitive the telescope and telescopes are getting more sensitive by the minute as it were the further back in time we can go and um, what, given all of these observations and um, the theory uh, about it where do you stand in um, what do you think is correct about the current theories we have about the origins of, of the universe well Currently, we have no theories about the actual origin of, of the universe. It would be wonderful if we had. I mean, we've got a number of speculations, and I've speculated as well how nothing, how absolutely nothing can roll over into appearing to be something, which you know, then 14 billion years later evolves into, into us. Um, uh, but we've got very substantial theories about the history of the universe as we know it. So um, we can be pretty confident about the last, all, the, all except the last few, the, pre, the first few seconds of the universe. So what have been, what have been your speculations about, uh, about the origins of the universe? And, oh. and have you changed your mind about it? Or? Um, I've not changed my mind. Uh, I've um, developed thoughts, um, and 
um, the, the book that I've recently written is about one aspect of the origin of the universe, which is the origin within it of the laws of nature, how they might come into um, existence. And um, uh, contrary to more complicated theories, I think that they, are, they arise from a mixture of indolence, ap uh, anarchy, and ignorance. And I think those are very those are three very powerful principles. Um, as to the, the deeper question about why absolutely nothing rolled over into being something, I, I've thought about that and written about that, but it's pure speculation. But what I wanted to do is not to present my own theory, but to show that it was not inconceivable that one could discuss apparently outrageous um, events in scientific terms, uh, the, the, the language of science would not fail even before the universe came into existence. And that was a, a difficult thing to do, but I, I tried to do it. It was certainly not um, pr any a pretense of being a theory of the origin of the universe, although I suspect, suspect privately that it might be right. <laughs> um, I want to ask you to uh, elaborate a bit more about um, the origins of the laws of nature and these three principles that you um, yes. that, that you outlined. Well, um, I, I think that when absolutely nothing rolled over into being apparently something, um, the a apparently something inherited the um, the uniformity of the absolute nothing from which was its parent. Never mind how the rolling over happened, that's another question. Um, but having inherited the uniformity of absolutely nothing, uh, there are consequences of that. And there's um, a very deep theorem uh, proposed by Emmy Noether, a German mathematician in the early 20th century, which shows that whenever you have uniformity of some kind, then you have a conservation law. And so one of the uh, the, 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 um, the great laws of nature is um, the conservation of energy. And uh, her theorem shows that that is a consequence of the uniformity of time. So if you can show that when the universe came into existence, it inherited the uniformity of nothing, and time on a cosmic scale was uniform, then you've immediately ac accounted for the uniform for, for the conservation of energy. So that was one wing of my argument. That's so fascinating. And, and could you um, talk about the anarchic aspect? Uh, yeah. Well, um, then, um, if um, indolence is too vigorous for you, then you resort to anarchy, I think, and you allow um, any kind of behaviour to happen. And I think you can show, and I in certain aspects you can show that if you allow every conceivable mode of behavior then some of it is self-annihilating and you're left with very simple behavior which does survive. So anarchy uh, um, leads to the um, to, uh, laws of nature like the propagation of light and because particles have a way of nature it leads also to the propagation of particles and therefore it leads to quantum mechanics. And because quantum mechanics leads to classical mechanics, it, it leads through the whole um, collection of the laws of nature. So understanding their origins simply means that we understand their manifestation in their day-to-day -day Well, it, it's, it's, um, I think there are two steps. One is, you know, where do the laws come from? And then what are the consequences? And so I don't bother about the consequences. I leave that to scientists to work out. You know, I'm interested in them, but it's not my prime concern. I mean, the real concern is what are the laws and where do those come from? Other people can then trouble themselves by working out the consequences. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.